Hi, my name is Greg Krasowski. I'm an attorney and a former police officer. Today I want to talk to you about dangerous drug cleans and answer some of the frequently asked questions that my office receives on a daily basis. If you think you have a dangerous drug claim or a claim against the manufacturer of a medical device, here's the first thing that you need to do. We'll start with dangerous drugs, basically prescription drugs. Number one, uh, check the pill box, the pill bottle. Uh, if you also have a receipt from the pharmacy, check that. Because we need to know whether you took the generic or the brand name version of the drug. That's the first issue. Uh, once you've got the pill bottle in front of you, uh, if necessary, stop by, stop by your pharmacy and try to get your pharmaceutical record. Uh, that printout that you'll get from the pharmacy will tell us exactly what you took, including the dosage and the name of the prescribing physician. Uh, today, uh, under current law, you can only file a claim against a brand name manufacturer for failure to warn you uh, if the injury, the medical pathology, the side effect that you're suffering from was not adequately and accurately disclosed on the warning label for the drug. So what does this mean? Uh, for instance, uh, we handle claims from people who believe they've been injured by lisinopril, a blood pressure drug. Uh, lisinopril happens to be a generic name, but the brand names for the drug are Zestrel, Prinavil, Tensorpro. So if someone has taken the generic, they may be basically out of luck because Current law does not allow you to sue the manufacturer of a generic. Your question is why? Well, when uh, the drug manufacturer goes to the FDA approval process for a particular medication, that's the manufacturer that's going to release the brand name drug on the market. And this drug enjoys pretty much almost like patent protection uh, for a number of years before generics can be released. So the drug label that's approved by the FDA that contains all the warning sections and the warnings of particular side effects, that drug label is approved by the FDA for that manufacturer for the particular brand name drug. So if you've taken a brand name drug, uh, what's the next thing? Well, make sure you review the warning label to see whether the symptom that you're suffering from is disclosed or mentioned on the warning label, including you know the little fine print, as well as the big black box warnings. Why is that important? Well, if the manufacturer has already warned you on the warning label, uh, then you're precluded from asserting a dangerous drug claim because you've been properly warned and you're assumed to have taken the, the risk yourself, uh, being fully informed. Unfortunately, we know that's not the case because most people who call us, uh, you know, these are lay people, they're not uh, medical professionals regular folks who've gone to their physician uh, or their nurse practitioner and they've uh, received a prescription for a particular drug. And often, about 99% of the cases that come into uh, my law office, the doctors or the physician's assistants or the nurse practitioners never really take the time to go through the warning label with the patient and alert them to all the potential side effects that they can suffer from that particular medication. And I think that's wrong because if you're a medical professional, you're bound by the Hippocratic Oath, which means before you render any treatment, if possible, if you're able, you should obtain your patient's fully informed consent. Obtaining a patient's fully informed consent means just that, that you have to give the patient full information about the pros and the cons of the treatment. In other words, the benefits and any detrimental potential side effects. So in the real world, well, how should that look like? If you're in a doctor's office, the doctor will prescribe, wants to prescribe you a drug for whether it's high cholesterol or high blood pressure or, or any other medical condition, the doctor should have the warning label or a printout of it. And the printouts are always available, by the way, on the FDA website. And say, hey, Jim, I want to prescribe to you this drug. Here's the highlighter, by the way. You, know, you should be aware that you could suffer these particular side effects, and some of them are serious and could potentially be life-threatening or seriously debilitating. Now, are you sure you're willing to take the chance, take the risk of taking this drug? Uh, 
doesn't take long, right? This is something a doctor could do maybe within two or three minutes. But for some reason, physicians aren't doing it. So what happens? Uh, you're a patient, you go to a doctor, you're, you're either paying him for his services or your health insurance carrier is paying for his services. And you may have a deductible, a uh, copay. You get a prescription, you go to a pharmacy, you get the drug, you know, obviously it should come with the drug insert attached or you know, in that envelope that you're getting, that paper bag you're getting the drug with. Uh, but most people aren't going to take the time uh, to go through the warning label. And most pharmacists, whether it's at a for big pharmacy chain like Walgreens or CVS, or some other one, or Rite Aid, uh, or, uh, you know, they're not gonna go through the warning label with you either. So, everything is pretty much up to you. And I don't think that's fair because as a patient, you're a physician, right? Or, or, or the physician's assistant that you've gone to. For instance, some of these urgent care centers that aren't staffed all the time with physicians, but are staffed with physician's assistants or nurse practitioners. Uh, these people are supposed to be your gatekeepers, right? They're the medical experts that you go to for treatment, and uh, they're supposed to be looking out for your rights and your health and your interests. But what happens instead? Instead, what we see is physicians being constantly marketed by drug company sales reps. And, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So... Remember, the first issue is, before you call us, um, if you've seen a page on our website, and this is why you're probably calling us, right? You've been referred to us by your local attorney or a friend, relative, colleague. Uh, you need to get all the information on the drug that you've taken. Look at the pill bottle. See if it has a brand name on it. See if it has a generic name. If you have the opportunity, look it up on the internet. Google it. Um, there are some pretty good websites like RxList and WebMD, and they'll give you information on drugs. Call your pharmacy or go to your pharmacy. Uh, get a printout of your pharmaceutical record. You should have that anyway, so you know what you've been prescribed over these years. Most pharmacies will be able to give you that record without having to, you know, dig it out of archives, probably for the next couple of two or three years. Uh, if necessary, you could go to your doctor's office and say, hey, uh, you know, I just want to keep track of what I've been taking. Can you please give me a, some sort of an excerpt for my medical records about all the, all the drugs that this particular doctor has prescribed or your, your medical office has prescribed to? That's another smart option. So once you know what you've taken, uh, next thing you need to do is to look at the drug label the warning label and see whether the side effects that you're suffering from, the medical conditions, are in a warning label. If they are, then you may not be able to sue. But we'll also talk about, in a little bit, the circumstances where you may be able to assert a claim against a drug manufacturer or even perhaps against your uh, local doctor for medical malpractice or the hospital or the other medical organization your doctor is affiliated with. Uh, so. Once you know what you've taken, whether the side effects that you're suffering from have been disclosed, obviously you need to know the dosage, things like that. Uh, and by the way, keep something in mind. Periodically, warning labels are updated by the drug manufacturer. Uh, and often, they're, the updates are mandated by the FDA. So it's useful to look at the FDA website. And there is a section that will give you the history of the changes to a drug particular drugs label, uh, and, and we do that as well. So you have a picture and you think you may have a claim because there's a side effect that you're suffering from, may be serious, but you didn't really see it adequately and accurately disclosed. And, and remember, uh, I say this for two reasons, right? There are two key words, adequately and accurately. So if let's say a particular drug has serious potential uh, substantial potential to cause serious damage. For instance, two, three, four, or five, or 10% of patients suffer from a particular side effect. But that side effect is just basically glanced over in the warning label in small print. That may not be adequate disclosure because it 
doesn't convey to the patient the likelihood of coming down with a particular condition. Uh, accurate disclosure means just that, that uh, the warning label has to accurately uh, inform you of a particular pathology that you could come down with, particular illness, side effect, things like that. If it's kind of, you know, obtuse, blurry, or all-inclusive, then I mean, that'd be an accurate warning. Uh, you, you may have a claim. Even if we pass that particular test, the next level is uh, to press a dangerous drug claim. We need to have medical, basically, scientific and statistical evidence that this particular drug, uh, brand name drug, has caused a particular, that certain side effect, that disease, that pathology, that medical condition that you're suffering from. Scientific evidence means we need medical opinions by doctors who are clinicians, you know, doctors who actively treat patients by medical researchers who may be MDs or PhDs who do research uh, in that particular area of medicine or pharmacology. Statistical evidence means that in order to be sure, you know, that this isn't some statistical what they call aberration, uh, you need to have hundreds, if not thousands of cases of people coming down with that particular condition from that particular brand name drug, that specific brand name drug. Uh, and that's a high hurdle to me. So this is why there's a bit of a misnomer in the dangerous drug practice of what are called class actions. You know, oh, just, and people will, will often call us and say, hey, do you have a class action against a particular manufacturer? These are actually collective lawsuits that are consolidated in the state court system or in a federal court system uh, against drug manufacturers or medical device manufacturers because each individual has their own particular claim. Uh, but when you have a group of claimants, a group of plaintiffs, hundreds, thousands, then uh, their lawsuits are combined uh, formally, procedurally within the court system, whether it's state court or federal court, and uh, they're prosecuted against the drug manufacturer, the medical device manufacturers, consolidated cases. So the next issue that we need to discuss is um, even if you suffered a, an identifiable side effect that was not accurately and accurately disclosed on the warning label of a brand name drug and even if we have scientific evidence or you have medical doctors opinions that they believe your condition was caused by a particular drug prosecuting these dangerous drug cases individually is just cost prohibitive it doesn't happen. Um, what we need to do is we need to get hundreds of cases in order to make this cost effective. Because you have to remember, you know, when a drug manufacturer puts a drug out on the market, they spend millions of dollars, not just on research, but also on marketing the drug. And they always set aside a pretty good war chest to handle any potential claims. So if you want to go up against the drug manufacturer, think about the money we would need to spend on medical experts that, and these experts will charge $500, $1,000 an hour. So we need medical experts that would be able to testify in court and then remember all these witness costs. You have to get them to the courtroom, housing, room and board, get them to testify, also pre-testimony prep. And these people are charging $500 to $1,000 an hour for their time as experts. Um, and we need to have these experts testify. So to do it for one individual, it's cost prohibitive. So uh, if we see a category of claims where that we think uh, have potential, and I say we have not just talked about my law office, but other lawyers that I work with and other lawyers around the country who are in a dangerous drug practice, uh, who will talk, you know, we talk to each other, we try to consolidate cases. If it's uh, viable, if we think we have a viable claim against a drug or medical device manufacturer. So uh, we, we may take down your contact information and just keep it on file to see if we get enough cases to show the statistics, right? Or to be able to get the medical experts. 
And during this whole time, right, we have the clock ticking against this because every state has statute of limitations. That's the legally imposed by a time period in which you can file a lawsuit, file a claim against a, a defendant, whether it's a medical device manufacturer or a drug manufacturer. And once you're pat, you know, once you've passed that statute of limitations, you may not have a claim. Well, so we've seen cases where uh, even though the statute of limitation period has already passed, uh, the fact that the drug has caused a particular side effect was only discovered later. And if that's the case, then what's called, you know, in legal terminology, the discovery rule applies, which means that, you know, you're able to assert a claim within a certain period of something being discovered. And whether a person could reasonably have been expected to know about something like this. You know, as a patient, how are you? If you may have taken a drug that caused you damage five or ten years ago, and only two or three years ago they found out that that drug had caused those particular medical conditions. You may have never known. Uh, it's rare that, you know, the FDA or the drug manufacturer or your doctor is going to send out these notices to everyone who took the drug. Or, or for instance, the pharmacy or the pharmaceutical, the pharmacy chain that you've gotten your prescription drug from. So even though the statute of limitations has passed, you, you know, there may be a possibility to still assert a claim. So let's look at the things that uh, we need to uh, overcome. We've got the need to make sure it's a brand name drug. By the way, there were a couple of states that allowed claims against generic manufacturers. Even though there was a U.S. Supreme Court decision a while back now that said, no, you can only serve claims against brand name manufacturers. The logic behind the decision was as follows. It said, well, if I'm the generic manufacturer of a drug, I didn't take part in the drug label approval process. It's not my drug label. Why should I be held responsible? Uh, so if you've taken my generic, you can't sue me. And then if you took a generic and you tried to sue the brand name manufacturer, the brand name manufacturer would say, well, you didn't take my drug. You took the generic version because you wanted to save money or because that's where your health insurance or prescription coverage mandated. Um, doesn't seem fair, but it's the law today. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, California and Alabama were an exception. But uh, as you can imagine, the pharmaceutical industry does a lot of lobbying to make sure that uh, it's protected within the law, uh, just like the medical industry. So let's get the cases, speaking of the medical industry, let's look at cases where you were prescribed a brand name or a generic drug uh, that was known to cause particular conditions, and your physician had an obligation to monitor 